G'day guys, Rukshani here. Thanks for joining me for the news vlog. I'm coming to you from my hotel room in regional Victoria. I might actually show you guys around this cool little place I'm staying tomorrow. Let's see how that goes. First up, let's just play this video of Donald J. Trump, President Trump, playing volleyball. There you see, makes a shot. That's it. <laughs> yes. And the reason I'm showing you Trump playing volleyball is because uh, this is from the 90s, actually. You can see from the hairstyle and the clothes people are wearing. But Donald J. Trump has been confirmed as the Republican nominee for the election coming up. So just read this article from Sky News. Locking it in, Donald Trump clinches 2024 Republican presidential nomination during Tuesday's primary. Donald Trump has officially secured the Re Republican Party's nomination, setting the stage for a rematch against President Joe Biden in November. So I understand there's lots of you know other legal cases and all sorts of other stuff going on around Donald Trump at the moment, but at least when it comes to securing the Republican primary, that is game, set, and match for President Trump. Now, his first act as president According to this uh, post on Truth Social that Donald J. Trump posted, he says, My first act as your next president will be to close the border, drill baby drill, and free the January 6 hostages being wrongfully imprisoned. Now that last one in particular around January 6 hostages has triggered all manner of people. And to be honest, they, he has been criticized in the past for not uh, pardoning them when he even had an opportunity during his presidency. But as you can see, he has committed to doing that when he becomes a president. And I think a lot of people are looking forward to that day coming because they are political prisoners in the West, in the US. Apparently, this land of democracy is something you see in banana republics, for instance, like Brazil. And the reason I bring that up is in Brazil, this individual, William, well, Wellington Luiz Firmino, he's been handed a 17-year prison sentence um, and it's his crime was that he was filming protests, pro-Bolsonaro protests, following their so-called uh, you know, insurrection as well around their Congress in Brazil on January 8th. So he has been sentenced to 17 years in prison, and all he did was film uh, footage from up on the top of a building, and for that he has been put in jail for 17 years. So that is a banana republic, but that is Brazil, and we expect this type of nonsense uh, from those type of countries. But we also have in the US prisoners uh, from J6 who are there as political prisoners for the mere act of protesting or walking through a building. Uh, it's complete lunacy. Now the next story I have guys is one that is breaking in the UK and it could have repercussions for Australia as well if we pay attention to what's actually happened here. So I'll just read this article from The Guardian. Children to stop getting puberty blockers at gender identity clinics, says NHS England. So let's play this video from Sky News to give you some context of what's going on here. And let's just bring you a bit of breaking news, which may be of interest to, to some of you. Uh, it's about puberty blockers. Now, uh, these are drugs that are used to delay the changes of puberty in transgender youngsters. Uh, in terms of how they are prescribed by the NHS, there has been a lot of controversy over the last few years about this. At the moment, they are only prescribed to children attending gender identity services as part of clinical research, um, and they are, are, are not routinely offered to children at gender identity clinics, but they are still offered. Well, the government, NHS England, has just confirmed that children will no longer be prescribed puberty blockers at gender identity clinics. This is coming from NHS England, that just broke in the last few moments. That's a pretty significant change, especially in terms of the way the world has been progressing in that field, right? Where all these type of things are being prescribed to kids uh, you know, every, every week it's something new. These these treatments are handed out like candy. And now you're seeing this uh, pullback, especially from NHS England, the public health service, uh, against this. And they went so far as to say, we have concluded that there is not enough evidence to support the safety or clinical effectiveness of puberty suppressing hormones to make the treatment routinely available at this time. So what evidence and what clinical effectiveness have they been relying on prior to this? Or has it always been an experiment of sorts, right? And when we consider that we have these type of programs in Australia as well, 
and you're seeing this pullback in the NHS services in England, what data sets or clinical effectiveness or safety trials are the Australian authorities and regulators and you know institutions who are prescribing these type of treatments to kids here? What are, what are, what standards are they using? Right, there's a shift happening here, and I believe that you know these kind of changes will actually lead potentially to changes here in Australia as well. Remains to be seen, but I am hopeful because I, I do feel that these things are co- very concerning. And on the back of that as well, if you want to read more into you know this similar topic, you can look up this article, Why Disturbing Leaks from US Gender Group WPATH Ring Alarm Bells in the NHS. Now, this is slightly unrelated, but it's on the same uh, you know broader topic of this kind of type of treatment for children. And this is from a group called uh, let me just find their name exactly. They are called the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And this leak has all types of things that I can't really, don't want to really go into too much detail on YouTube, but you can go read that yourself. With the NHS thing in particular, it has been a topic of concern and, uh, you know, contentious issue for a very long time. This is in 2021. This video you can go watch is on Channel 4 News. And this has a former staff governor from that same Tavistock uh, department of the NHS saying that he faced disciplinary action when he brought up those concerns back then. And now today you have the NHS themselves saying that they have come to a conclusion that they don't want to run these programs the way they've been running them for all those years. So again, I can't go into too much detail about all of this on this these type of platforms because, of course, you know, they they have all types of policies against speaking out against these things, even when right you have public health services putting out these type of messages ridiculous i know in australia uh, somewhat related to this chris mins shared this today he's the premier of new south wales labor premier he said it is the first step of a big change but the right one conversion practices are dangerous and there is no room for them in new south wales our bill to ban to ban lgbtq plus conversion practices in new south wales has just entered parliament so this is a part of a suite of you know bills and laws and legislations that we're seeing you know across many states in in Australia and tied to some of this are these issues around gender dysphoria uh, treatments for children and you know the way parental rights works when it comes to these type of issues. So it's a very broad topic, uh, but this is the kind of thing that's happening in Australia and there is a lot of resistance in Australia for uh, politicians or people who are. Uh, worried about what's happening, raise these issues, uh, you know, there's p- certain politicians, particularly within the Greens and Labour, that don't want to have anything to do with looking into these issues. So hopefully what's happening in the UK will lead to some changes in Australia. One can hope. Next up, guys, is it is a story that someone told me that I should cover on my YouTube comments yesterday around the wife of Emmanuel Macron. Uh, what is her name? Is it Bridget? Brigitte, yes, I can't say it in the French way, but French President Emmanuel Macron slams baseless rumours his wife is trans. French President Emmanuel Macron has addressed baseless rumours circling that his wife, Brigitte, is trans, denouncing the claims as fabricated scenarios. Speaking at an International Women's Day event in Paris, Macron, 46, candidly spoke about the ongoing right-wing conspiracy theory about Brigitte, 70, whom he married in 2007. So originally, apparently, this this rumor or this conspiracy uh, was actually uh, put forward by two individuals in the country that itself, in France, and they were subsequently, I, I believe, they faced legal legal consequences for for that. Now, it has been recently picked up by political commentator Candace Owens, and she she actually bet her career on politician's wife being a man, and uh, she says it's terrifying. Conservative commentator Candace Owens said she would bet her career that French President Emmanuel Macron's wife, Brigitte, is a man. After looking into this, I would stake my entire professional reputation on the fact that Brigitte Macron is in fact a man, Owens wrote in a Tuesday post on X, formerly Twitter. And any journalist or publication that is trying to dismiss this plausibility is immediately identifiable as establishment. I have never seen anything like this in my life. The implications here are terrifying. So if you want to find out about this, I encourage you, you can go look up Candace Owens, find that video where she is discussing this in great detail. Again, this is a touchy topic. I won't be going into too much detail about this, but uh, suffice to say that 
you know, the whole relationship between Macron and this individual, his wife, uh, is not a, uh, you know, standard relationship that we would be somewhat, uh, you know, as, as a conventional relationship. Uh, I, I believe they met when he was 15 and she was his teacher, uh, who was around 40 years of age at that time. Um, and he was a classmate of her daughter. And they began a relationship when he was 16 years old. And they married when he was 29 and she was 54. So it is not the most conventional relationship out there. And uh, of course, he became stepfather to his classmate, essentially, uh, his wife's daughter, who he was a classmate with. But uh, yes, uh, I want to preface all of that by saying that I believe the legal age of consent in France is 15. So make of all this what you will. I won't go into too much detail around this. You can go look up Candace Owens' uh, video. She explains and talks about this in great detail. Next up, guys, some news from Australia. There are calls now for the suburban rail loop to be paused amid cost blowout. The Victorian opposition is calling for on the besieged suburb, suburban rail loop to be paused after new figures showed cost for part of the project had ballooned by an extra $16 billion. That's billion with a B. Figures released from the Parliamentary Budget Office this week found the first two stages of the project are now blowing out the cost of the entire project to $216 billion. When announcing the concept in 2018, the government forecast the total cost to reach $50 billion. I don't think I want to read any more into this, but how does $50 billion turn into $216 billion? How does that happen? I think it only happens in states like Victoria, $216 billion. It's crazy to think how much this project is costing us. A lot of people are calling for it to be scrapped. Let me know what your thoughts are. Do you think it should be scrapped if you live in Victoria? Do you think there is a case, a use case scenario to catch a you know train from Cheltenham here all the way to Melbourne Airport? Or do you think people should catch a train into the city and then from the city to the airport, um, which wouldn't cost as much. Is there actually a use case scenario for this type of suburban rail loop to even exist? I don't know, for $216 billion, there's probably so much more that could be done. And in many other countries, most likely, uh, it would be done for a lot less and a lot sooner. This one, guys, I wanted to give you an update on a story from New Zealand. I don't know if you remember a few, probably a few months ago now, we were talking about the New Zealand Greens MP, Gloriz Gaharaman, uh, who was caught shoplifting on multiple videos. And she was shoplifting very expensive items from designer stores and, and this kind of stuff, right? I think $9,000 worth of goods is what she is alleged to have shoplifted. Well, I don't say alleged because she's actually pled guilty to shoplifting now. And this is the individual here, the Greens MP, of course, another hypocrite um, who was, uh, you know, preaching one thing out in public and then shop, shoplifting in private. Uh, and she's been caught. And look, she could potentially face up to seven years in jail uh, maximum, I think. And if convicted on this charge, she faces a maximum of three months in jail. So that's for a smaller charge. But all up, I think it's around seven years in jail. Very unlikely um, this individual will find herself facing the maximum penalty. Uh, it would be good to see a politician face some type of justice. But what, what usually happens is they get some sort of uh, you know sob story put together because they pled guilty early. And then they'll end up on some type of community service type uh, thing or you know get, get uh, time off their sentence maybe for the services they've done in the past. And of course, as an MP, as someone who's contributed to the public, as a Greens MP, whatever that means, uh, she might get some leniency when it comes to sentencing. So if you're watching from New Zealand, let me know what you think should happen to Glories. Should she face seven years in jail for shoplifting uh, those luxury goods while an MP? Last up, guys, I wanted to talk about this story. Um, this is from Six News Australia. They just posted this that saying, Marybeck City Council in Melbourne votes to fly Palestinian flag until there's a ceasefire in Gaza and commits to not doing any business with companies involved with weapons used in war. Mayor Adam Pulford. 
So yes, I mean, on this news, I am sure this has actually helped the ceasefire process in Gaza and the whole Middle East is now looking at looking at what Marybeth Council is doing. Uh, instead of doing their job of roads, rates and rubbish, here they are again, another council here in the state of Victoria, getting involved in issues that have absolutely nothing to do with them and doing symbolic gestures that really uh, don't lead to anything besides just wasting their time and them not doing their job. Anyway, guys, that is my update for today. If you enjoy my videos, you can subscribe to me on YouTube at The Real Rukshan. Hit that subscribe button or the notification bell and you'll get updates from me as I post. You can also find me on X, Instagram, Rumble, Odyssey, Facebook at The Real Rukshan. See you guys all tomorrow.